So first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Safer, Doc, Dr. Spiegel, um, for hosting this event, to the selection, uh, the Faculty Interaction Committee, and, and Dr. Stanley for, for thinking of this, recommending this. I think it was a brilliant idea. Um, and, um, and to the selection committee for, for choosing me amongst, I think, um, many faculty members at Montefiore who are equally deserving. I suspect that the strong interaction that I have with John and his body of work that you just heard about had something to do with it. For the first 20 or so years of, of my career, my focus was primarily clinical. And my collaborators were, were mainly people from other institutions. Uh, more recent interactions with, with John and others at Einstein have opened a, a new chapter in my career. Like you, I'm, I'm just astounded by the science, and, but I'm particularly enthusiastic about applying these scientific discoveries that you heard about to the care of our patients. And for that opportunity, I'm grateful to John um, and our other close collaborator, Tom Rohan, who provides a very complementary skill set to, to the two of us and to the many other talented people associated with their teams that I've gotten to know because of the work that, that we've done together. So I entitled the talk Bronx Tale because um, Montefiore and, and Einstein are arguably the two of the greatest institutions in the Bronx. And I think it's very fitting that I'm involved in, in one of the first talks that involves a collaboration for Einstein and Montefiore because I have lived in the nexus of Montefiore and Einstein literally my entire life. That is the, the house that I spent my childhood on, 3243 Colden Avenue. And you can see, there's the house right there. My, my room is up here somewhere, if you can see it. Um, at that time, growing, growing up in the Bronx, the, the people were, were different, but their character was the same. So, the house on the left were the Goldbergs, the Goldfeathers, the Sandlers, and the Speranos. Um, and, and that was a, a great period of my life. And, and you can see Montefiore here, um, which is only about 1.4 miles walking distance. And on the, on the walk there, you can see the, the school to the left that I went to school in and the church that I was, I was married in. There's Einstein, about 1.9 miles. And there's PS76, now referred to as the, the Bennington School, which is um, a, a, a schoolyard where I spent a lot of my youth playing pretty much every sport imaginable, punch ball, stick ball, softball, roller hockey, basketball. None of them particularly well, but, but I still, still enjoyed it. And we did have some notoriety on, on our block. Um, and about 30 or so years ago, um, one of my neighbors was the first uh, person to, to win a huge uh, lottery. Uh, um, and he, he, was, he was the father of one of my close friends. At that time, it was the largest jackpot ever won by an individual in the history uh, of the lottery. So that's where the Bronx tale began. But more seriously, um, the cancer burden and, and the, the challenge that we face in terms of the cancer burden is, is enormous. Um, in the U.S. and globally, uh, cancer is a leading cause of death. The risk of cancer death is about 22% in men and 19% in women. There are racial gaps in some cancer types. And the increasing incidence with age will uh, indicates that cancer will become a greater uh, burden as our population ages. And this is... Um, problem is exacerbated by the fact that there is a projected uh, workforce shortage in oncology and cancer care and an increase in cost of cancer care. And in particular, in our community in the Bronx and beyond, we have a large minority uh, population. There are high rates of smoking, obesity, HIV, and comorbidities. There are high poverty rates and a large elderly poor population. And there are language and cultural ba barriers to care. So all of this amplifies the, the enormity of the challenge that we face as clinicians serving this population. Cost is another huge factor that we can't ignore. The number of cancer survivors ex is expected to increase from about 14 to 18 million between 2010 and 2020. That pr produces enormous stress in our healthcare system to provide adequate care for these patients in a, in a very efficient and compassionate way. 
The total cost for cancer care in 2020 is projected to be about $170 billion, representing about a 40% increase over a decade. And the authors concluded of this analysis that the national cost of cancer care is substantial and expected to increase because of population changes alone. And our findings have implications for poly policymakers and planning and allocation of resources. So this um, represents an enormous challenge for an integrated healthcare delivery system like ours. And this doesn't even take to account the rising, the skyrocketing cost of drugs. There is good news, and that is cancer mortality is declining in the U.S. And this is, um, this is largely because of increased screening and uh, improved systemic therapies for early stage disease. However, a racial divide remains and the cancer burden in the minority population that we serve is increasing. So shown here are cancer incidents on the top. Um, the spike in men is, is due to PSA screening. Uh, and on the bottom you see starting in the 1990s there's been a decline in cancer-related mortality. On the right is shown breast cancer mortality. And you could see it's declining for both whites and blacks, but remains substantially higher for the black population. And on the left, you, um, this racial divide is, is illustrated further because you can see that um, the comparing um, non-Hispanic blacks compared with non-Hispanic whites on the uh, bottom left, um, blacks have about a 50% higher risk of breast cancer mortality. Um, the silver lining for the um, black community has been cancer rates, breast cancer rates are always lower. But for the first time in 2015, breast cancer rates in black women equaled what they were in white women. So this just, again, highlights the enormity of the challenge that we face in, in managing the population. What is the basis for this? And on this slide, I'm going to outline some of the work that I've been involved with that um, related to um, using uh, retrospective analysis of, of clinical trials where the primary purpose was not to answer the scientific questions that, are, that, are, that we were looking for, but to um, for hypothesis generation, um, and also by bi uh, biobanking specimens, we were able to um, address uh, specific clinical questions. So firstly, there are higher obesity rates in black women, and we know that there is a 1.4-fold increased risk of triple negative breast cancer, a particularly lethal form of breast cancer in young obese women. This undoubtedly contributes to the two-fold higher risk of triple negative breast cancer that we see in black women. In addition to, compound, uh, in addition to, to this, uh, the work that we've done has shown that there's about a 1.5-fold increase in mortality for black women who have estrogen receptor positive disease, a more favorable type of breast cancer that accounts for about two-thirds of all breast cancer. This curve on the right shows the annual risk of having a recurrence for women who have triple negative breast cancer of all races. You see it's much higher in the first five years after diagnosis. And for women with ER positive breast cancer where the risk is steady. And you could see the, although obesity uh, shown, uh, patients who are obese, uh, shown in the uh, dotted lines, I believe, um, excuse me, the solid lines, have similar uh, risk of recurrence for triple negative disease. For ER positive disease, obesity is associated with a, about a twofold higher risk of, of recurrence. So, we're seeing higher, so that's, that's a significant problem. The second problem is that we're seeing higher recurrence and mortality rates in non-obese black women, and that's shown on the bottom right-hand panel. The red curve indicates uh, women who are black and, and, and non-obese. And for some reason that's not clear, uh, they seem to be experiencing worse outcomes. They should be having the best outcomes. And so this is an enigma that requires um, more attention. And, and this is uh, something that we're seeing in clinical trial populations who have access to care and we're getting the exact same treatment. And finally, we've noticed in some of our work that black women have higher toxicity rates. In particular, they have a twofold higher risk of taxane-induced neuropathy. And we've identified a uh, genetic variation associated with this risk. And this is playing out in our Montefiore cohort in work uh, that's been published by Jeff Cabot, Tom Rohan, and Mindy Ginsburg, looking at the patients that we've treated at our center over a 10-year period that included nearly 4,000 women with breast cancer, about a, a third of whom were black. Black race was associated with nearly a two-fold higher risk of recurrence when adjusted for age, stage, tumor size, grade, and treatment. 
So how do we make a dent? How do we improve uh, clinical outcomes for, for patients with breast cancer and all cancer types? And what I'd like to focus on is cancer clinical trials as a, as a tool to, to make progress. And what I'd like to do is provide an abbreviated history of cancer clinical trials. In medicine, um, the first randomized trial was uh, done in the mid-1700s, which was a randomized trial of citrus to prevent scurvy in sailors. Later, um, epidemiology was born, uh, uh, was given birth by a French physician who um, I realized the importance of counting and uh, did the first case control study of venesection for uh, pneumonia, which disproved the, te uh, the teachings of Galen, which had existed for centuries. Um, in the 1900s, co Congress established the Public Health Service, the National Cancer Institute, and the NIH. And reports first started appearing in the literature in the 1950s that described methods for clinical trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then in 1948, the first randomized clinical trial of streptomycin was published uh, uh, for, for tuberculosis. The history of cancer research uh, dates back to about 1950, where Sidney Farber first uh, described temporary remissions in five children with leukemia who were treated with aminopterin. James Holland in New York then uh, organized the first clinical trials in acute leukemia. And in 1956, the U.S. Senate directed the NCI to establish a cooperative system to study cancer. It was not too uh, soon thereafter that Emil Fry published the first randomized uh, group trial uh, in leukemia. And then um, in, in 1971, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act and um, issued the war on cancer and established the NCI designated cancer centers, including Einstein as one of the first uh, funded cancer centers. More recently, an Institute of Medicine report uh, made recommendations to reorganize a structure, and the cooperative group structure was reorganized in 2014. And this is the structure as it is today. It's, called, it's referred to as a National Clinical Trials Network, and it, and it includes uh, research bases, such as ECOG Akron, the group that we're affiliate with, affiliated with, which, which coordinates uh, these large trials and uh, the sites, including the NCORP, the so-called NCORP, or National Community Oncology uh, Research Program. This is the network of the NCTN uh, sites uh, and the early uh, phase clinical trials network supported by the NCI. And Montefiore and Einstein have a prominent position in this network through its NCI-designated cancer center and through its minority uh, underserved uh, NCORP research program. This slide, again, illustrates the infrastructure that's provided by the Cancer Center, led by David Goldman, which has five research programs and, and 14 shared resources. And this serves as the anchor for the research enterprise here. Um, other important components include the minority underserved NCORP, which I described, an AIDS malignancy consortium, uh, which is led by Lakshmi Rajdev, a Calabresi K-12 career development program, which is led by Roman Perez Solar, um, the research bases, uh, that you see affiliated with our NCORP, and the T32 uh, training grants. And the centralized protocol and data management shared resource at our center has facilitated and enabled the accrual of over 4,000 patients to therapeutic uh, cancer trials since 2001, and about 2000, uh, about 60 percent are minorities. That compares with about 8 percent of the national average. So moving on, um, to how do we make an impact in the disease, sometimes it involves a, way in, in a change in the way that people think. And in the 1950s, breast cancer, and earlier, breast cancer was thought of as a local disease. And if you could just cut it out, you would cure patients. And this is, was the initial thought, that surgery or local therapy would render a patient disease free. And that happens very reliably. But unfortunately, it happens um, for too many patients for only a short period of time. And we know from experience that re recurrences can occur in the local regional area like lymph nodes, in the lungs, the liver, uh, and the bones. So the point here is that distant metastasis is the primary cause of death even when the disease is uh, initially localized. So that was really a critical concept that changed how we think about managing breast cancer. And um, fortunately, 
the story today is much different than it was in, in 1976, my first year as a student at the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. Um, at, during that year, there was really no screening tool. We now have digital mammography, MRI, and other modalities to detect early stage breast cancer. The local therapy included radical mastectomy with axillary dissection. We're now doing less radical surgery, wide excision, and central lymph node biopsy, which is less um, debilitating. And we're also using modern radiation therapy techniques to help control local disease. At the time, there was no such thing as systemic therapy given uh, after local therapy, but now we routinely use chemotherapy, endocrine therapy, and anti-HER2-directed direct, uh, therapy, which substantially reduce the risk of recurrence. And at that time, in 1976, we had no biomarkers that can help us direct therapy. We now have ER, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor expression, and HER2 expression that can help guide uh, endocrine therapy and HER2-directed therapy. We have gene expression assays that can help identify which uh, patients really need treatment. And we can identify individuals who are at really highest risk for developing cancer based on um, germline uh, heritability. Just to show you some examples of progress that had their origins here at Einstein, um, Susan Horowitz described the uh, initial uh, mechanism, uh, uh, novel mechanism of action of, of Taxol uh, back in 1979. And it was 40 years later that I led a national clinical trial that showed the administration of Paclitaxel given in a certain way could improve survival in patients with uh, early stage breast cancer. So we were making progress in, in curing early stage disease. The problem is we were over-treating many patients. And one of the newer tools that became available was a gene expression assay called the uh, Oncotype DX Recurrence Score, which involves 21 genes. And what this, um, and this is a, a, a gene expression assay that's now commercially available. It's been done in about 600,000 patients since its uh, inception about a decade ago and its commercial availability. And what this assay has allowed us to do is, is identify those patients who are more likely to benefit from therapy and those who don't need any therapy. So on the left, you see the benefit of chemotherapy. In a, the blue line indicates a population of patients treated with chemotherapy. The dotted line indicates those patients treated with just endocrine therapy. The curve on the right illustrates that you can identify about a quarter of those patients who are deriving most of the benefit from chemotherapy. And rather than being a 3 to 5% absolute benefit, there's actually a 25% absolute benefit from therapy. This results in a uh, this is just another way of showing that the, the um, a forest plot showing that the group on the bottom with the highest recurrence score, again, have a 75% reduction in their risk of having a recurrence rather than a 25% relative reduction. So this was an important advance that occurred in the scene about a decade ago. But we were still using, uh, over-treating many patients with chemotherapy. So in order to advance precision, we launched the trial assigning individualized op options for treatment or the Taylor X trial, a trial that I've um, been involved with uh, for the past 14 years. Um, and the question here was, can we uh, chemotherapy be spared in early estrogen receptor positive breast cancer using this gene expression uh, um, assay or biomarker? This is the most common subtype of breast cancer. It accounts for about one half of all breast cancers. And about um, 100,000 women uh, are diagnosed with this condition each year. Um, and many of those are, are probably being overtreated. So we designed this trial in a way that would minimize the uh, potential for uh, undertreatment. Uh, we took patients who received their local therapy surgery, they had a recurrence score, and we assigned therapy or randomized patients based on their recurrence score. So if the recurrence score was low, we treated patients with endocrine therapy alone because we had good evidence at that time that that would be safe. If it was high, we uh, directed them to chemoendocrine therapy. And if they were in a situation of therapeutic equipoise, they were randomized to the uh, standard arm, which was chemoendocrine therapy, versus the experimental arm of endocrine therapy alone. This trial accrued 7,000, uh, actually 10,000 patients over a period of four years, um, 7,000 of whom fell in the mid-range group and were randomized. So we used the 21 gene assay, which had high analytic uh, validity. In other words, it was reproducible and reliable. It had high clinical validity. It was associated with clinical outcome but we still weren't quite sure about the clinical utility of the assay. In other words, do patients benefit from using this assay? We targeted a, a group of patients who were being overtreated, we thought, and we picked a recurrence score range where the actual risk of dis recurrence could range anywhere from 7 to 16% at 10 years with endocrine therapy alone. Well, we do have some results of this trial, finally now, at least for the low-risk registry. 
And what we found is that for patients who have the lowest recurrence score, which accounted for about 16% of the population, that their recurrence risk was 1% at five years with endocrine therapy alone and no chemotherapy. Since chemotherapy prevents mainly er early recurrences, we, th we feel that this is very good evidence that we can effectively spare chemotherapy. And as a matter of fact, uh, for the first time in the most recent uh, eighth edition of the AJCC uh, staging system, this um, is now included as uh, an element in staging patients, so that patients who have a recurrence score of 11 uh, who have ER positive node negative disease are considered low risk irrespective of what their other uh, f features may be. It's been seven years since the randomized component of the trial uh, closed and we still don't have a result. But there's evidence from population-based study that, that these patients probably also don't need chemotherapy. And this is an analysis that was recently uh, presented involving 50,000 patients treated over, over eight years derived from the SEER database. The chemotherapy use was decided by the clinician and it was found that the five-year breast cancer-specific mortality rates were similar, irrespective of whether adjuvant chemotherapy were used, uh, in the range of between 0.5 and 1% for patients, for the two-thirds of patients who have a recurrent score of 11 to 25. So we anxiously await the final and official results of, of the randomized component of the trial, which I think will have a, a major impact on clinical practice. And this slide, I think, shows that it has uh, influenced how uh, clinicians think uh, and manage patients. Uh, shown in the green line is the uh, uptake of the oncotype assay from 2007 to 2010, and the orange curve indicates the proportion of patients receiving chemotherapy, which declined from 60% down to about uh, 50%, and now is in the range of about 30%. Well, we've taken many steps to address an important clinical problem, early relapse prevented by chemotherapy. What about late relapse, a relapse occurring five or more years? This is a, a major clinical problem. It, occurs, it, it accounts for about half of all breast cancer recurrences. So we designed, uh, with funding from the, from the Susan G. Komen Foundation and the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, we designed a um, clinical trial, if you will, for patients who are already on a clinical trial who are alive uh, and disease-free at five and a half years. Uh, and uh, we collected uh, biospecimens on them uh, at, at the time of enrollment. And in particular, the highest risk population um, who had positive lymph nodes, we also did a circulating tumor cell assay at baseline and also drew fasting blood specimens. We now have preliminary data from this high risk, uh, from this group, and we found that remarkably, 5% of patients who are otherwise clinically disease free, who have no evidence of cancer, have circulating tumor cells in their bloodstream. And in this population that we enrolled in the trial, this is about 500 patients, 3% of them had a recurrence over, over uh, about two years. And there was a 20-fold increased risk in recurrence for those who had, who had a circulating tumor cells versus those who didn't. So we think that this provides an important proof of concept that a blood-based blood -based biomarker, after completing five-year course of adjuvant endocrine therapy, will provide clinically relevant prognostic information. And the potential implication here is a new management paradigm. We, can now, we now may be able to risk stratify for late, late recurrence based on a blood-based biomarker. Low risk, stop endocrine therapy after five years. Um, high risk, continue endocrine therapy or uh, enroll patients on clinical trials to test new agents to prevent a late recurrence. And it also provides a platform to test more modern technologies such as circulating tumor DNA. Well, there's also a need to pursue further progress and greater preci precision, and that's where the interaction with the tumor microenvironment uh, program comes in. This curve here uh, is taken from a report showing the long-term outcome for patients at 20 years treated with local therapy alone. And as you can see, up to half of them relapse at 20 years. And as I've shown you before, distant metastasis is the primary cause of death despite local presentation and local therapy. And we know that more aggressive local therapies, such as mastectomy or a radical mastectomy, does not re reduce recurrence. And as I've already shown you, there's a continued risk of recurrence beyond five to 10 years, especially in ER positive disease. Adjuvant chemotherapy or any adjuvant systemic therapy can improve that situation. And we now know, as I've shown you, that biomarker-directed adjuvant systemic therapy reduces recurrence and breast cancer mortality. And those include endocrine therapy for the 70% of women who have estrogen receptor positive disease, anti-HER2-directed therapy for the 20% who have HER2 expression, um, and chemotherapy in those who have um, high-risk disease. However, some are cured with no therapy, and others are cured despite systemic therapy. 
but there are no biomarkers reflecting the metastatic process or treatment blocking metastasis. And this is where the interaction with the tumor microenvironment program comes in. So I'd like to just briefly recapitulate what John has already told you, that TMEM are entravasation sites that serve as a doorway for metastasis, that TMEM can be found in both the primary tumor and in metastatic sites, that higher TMEM score in the primary tumor is associated with an increased risk of distant metastasis. And as he's shown you, chemotherapy induces TMEM formation. Tumors actually become more efficient at promoting metastasis despite the fact that they're getting smaller. And lastly, TMEM function can be inhibited by a drug, uh, the TIE2 inhibitor rabastinib. So our work in hypothesis is that these metastasis biomarkers will provide complementary uh, prognostic and predictive information to existing biomarkers, and that chemotherapy and other anti-cancer treatments may be more effective when combined with inhibitors of TMEM function. And here is an example uh, uh, of that. So here is uh, one of the first uh, studies, a case control study led by Tom Rohan, involving 259 case control pairs from a population-based cohort. About half had no negative or low-risk disease. About half received adjuvant chemotherapy. And there was, it was found that there was no correlation with uh, something called IHC4, which is kind of a proxy for the oncotype, nodal status, or TMEM score. But TMEM score was prognostic in the ER positive HER2 negative disease in a multivariate uh, model that included the important covariates. And this was true whether one looked at it as a categorical variable, high versus low, or a continuous variable. We also then uh, took this in partnership with Joan Jones and Maya Octay to a clinical trial cohort that I um, was able to secure access to. And we found the same thing, uh, and this time with a twist, in that we found that um, the TMEM score was actually adding information to the recurrence score, the test that's been ordered about a half a million, um, 500,000 times in women with breast cancer. And we found that for women who had a mid versus low uh, TMEM score, there was about a two-fold increase in risk of recurrence. For those who had the recurrence score um, value that was in the intermediate or equipoise range. And if it was high versus low, it was fourfold higher. And it predicted early recurrence, which is a type of recurrence that can be prevented with chemotherapy. So early on, as I began learning about John's work, um, I became intrigued with uh, what was happening to, to the TMEMs in the, in the primary tumor um, because of the fact that we knew from historical data that inducing damage in the microenvironment causes an influx of macrophages. And so the hypothesis was that maybe this could affect the TMEM uh, number or function. So in partnership with the team shown here, and as John has shown you, we looked at patients who were getting systemic chemotherapy before their surgery, so-called neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And to our astonishment, as John has shown you, we found a striking uh, increase in TMEM score in patients who had residual cancers uh, at the time of surgery. So even though their tumors were smaller, they were much more efficient in disseminating cancer cells to other organs. And this was statistically significant. We then did a took this information, was taken from the, the bedside to the bench. The previous example was bench to bedside. And this involved the work that John has already shown you. Um, and that a team that included George, Jessica, and Maya looked at this in four different breast cancer models, including two human-derived uh, uh, breast cancer xenografts taken from patients uh, treated here at Montefiore. And we saw the same thing in, in animals that were seen in patients. Higher TMEM score, increasing circulating tumor cells, despite the fact that their tumors were getting smaller. Astonishing. So that provides, I think, a platform for evaluating this potent TI2 inhibitor to block TMEM function. Um, and this is mediated mainly by blocking the interaction between angiopotin uh, and 2 and TI2. Upon that stimulation, there's release of VEGF that opens the, t the door at the TMEM site. And this door remains open for up to 20 minutes during which time billions of tumor cells are, are intravasating into the circulation. John has shown you the partnership and the compound that, um, that we're a uh, company and, and compound that we're working with. And um, this just shows that this um, drug is an exquisite in inhibitor of TIE2, um, having very low um, uh, nanomolar range uh, IC50s. It also has activity against BCR able and FLT3, uh, which are leukemia um, oncogenes. And um, so this led to its being tested as a leukemia drug, as I'll show you. 
And the bottom two curves just show the fact that this is an exquisitely po inhibit, uh, potent inhibitor of TIE2 with a, about 100% inhibition um, and um, at, the, at the concentrations that, that can be achieved clinically and that this um, inhibition is persistent out to 24 hours. So this agent has been studied in humans with AML and CML initially based on its fact that it can, it can block um, or it can, it can target uh, BCR able and FLT3 oncogenes in, in acute leukemia. And what you can see here is that in humans treated with this drug, uh, you could see concentrations at the lowest doses that we're using in our clinical trial that far exceed the dotted line, which is the concentration that you need to inhibit TI2. You also see in patients that there is a reflex increase in angiopotent 2, as you expect, indicating that you're effectively targeting the TI2 receptor. Um, the drug does have some side effects, like many anti-cancer therapies. The ones that were uh, of interest include muscular weakness, and this is due to the off-target effects of the tankerases that I showed you in that chart before, um, some visual issues, and hypertension, which is an anti-VEGF effect. So um, based on that work, we've designed in collaboration with Jesus Anampa, a Calabrese K-12 scholar and a CRTP student, a phase 1B trial of rabacinib plus antitubulin therapy in patients with HER2-negative advanced breast cancer. The objectives are to identify the rec recommended phase 2 dose of rabacinib plus antitubulin therapy, to study its pharmacodynamic effects, and to generate preliminary uh, safety and efficacy uh, data to provide a foundation for subsequent definitive trials in advanced and early stage breast cancer. So we're studying a cohort uh, treated with paclitaxel plus um, a low dose of rabacinib. Thus far, of the three patients that we've treated, none have had a dose-limiting toxicity, and we're now studying at the second and final dose level. And we're also studying it with another commonly used drug called aribulin. Paclitaxel we commonly use at the front end of treatment. Aribulin you, we commonly use at the back end of treatment. And shown here is what happens to the circulating tumor cells in one patient that we've treated. An astounding effect. Um, here you could see that there were about nearly 4,000 circulating tumor cells per milliliter of blood uh, in this particular patient before they started therapy. And by uh, two weeks of rabacinib therapy and two doses of chemotherapy, you could see that um, the tumor cells um, have been cleared from the circulation. So we're now taking this to the next step with the ultimate goal to be able to design treatments that block metastasis. In metastatic breast cancer, we're doing a randomized phase two trial. We're planning a randomized phase two trial of aribulin chemotherapy with or without rabacinib. The hypothesis here is that rabacinib will prevent the development of new metastasis and improve clinical outcomes. We're doing this with the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consor Consortium. And in locally advanced breast cancer, we're doing a randomized trial in a neoadjuvant or pre-surgical setting. And our hypothesis here is that rabacinib will enhance the effectiveness of chemotherapy and reduce tumor cell seeding to distant organs. And this is being done with a group called the iSpy2 Consortium. So John and I have talked about our work for the last, I guess it's hour or so, but this is by far not the only examples of outstanding work that's being done. And I've shown you some selected examples here of funded collaboration between uh, uh, Einstein and Montefiore investigators uh, in cancer, all of whom are funded. And there are also Montefiore uh, and Einstein faculty uh, that are leading major clinical efforts in the NCTN who are shown here. So to conclude, cancer death rates are declining, but challenges remain. Incremental improvements in outcome have been achieved in part through the clinical trials, some of which I've described to you. However, the national and global cancer burden remains enormous due to multiple factors, including the aging population, workforce shortages, the cost of cancer care in high-income countries, and resource and infrastructure limitations in low to middle-income countries. We're accelerating progress and improving precisions, as, you, as you've seen, through clinical trials, which is an essential instrument for achieving both goals. And this is, integral, this is an integral component in the spectrum of contemporary cancer care. And I believe that Montefiore and Einstein are both well-positioned to impact cancer care uh, locally, nationally, and globally by trans translating scientific discoveries to the clinic by developing innovative models for delivering cancer care, which I didn't talk about at all, and for weaving clinical and translational research into the fabric of cancer care. To conclude, I'd, I'd like to um, acknowledge some key organizations who've either, uh, who've either financially supported the work you've seen or enabled it. This includes federal uh, and philanthropic organizations such as NCI, the Coleman Foundation, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, None of this progress in cancer care that I showed you would have been possible without this. 
I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the research organizations that have enabled this work, especially the f federally funded ECOG Akron um, Cancer Research Group and the TBCRC, our newest partner. I would also like to thank our center and departmental leaders, and talk, including Dr. Perez uh, Solar, Goldman, and Kalnicki, who have given me unwavering support and done nothing but encourage and enable me to do um, what I enjoy most. I would also uh, sincerely like to thank the physicians, nurses, um, research, and administrative staff who um, I partner with, including some members of the medical oncology breast cancer team shown here. and the multidisciplinary team shown here uh, at our multidisciplinary conference. When I first started this weekly patient management conference 12 years ago, I had no idea how essential it would be in coordinating patient care. And I'd also like to thank um, and acknowledge Dr. Shelley Feldman, an internationally known breast surgeon, um, and more importantly, a real mensch, whose very recent addition has raised our breast cancer um, clinical care and research team in a very short time um, to heights that um, never before were achieved or that I ever imagined. I'd also like to give a special thanks to the physicians, nurses, uh, physicians assistants, regulatory and study coordinators um, who, who support our team. Um, actually, they're on the previous slide. Uh, their diligence, professionalism, and dedication are true to the Montefiore motto of, of doing more. Of course, I'd like to thank my fellow faculty members and trainees who share my passion for cancer research and, cl and um, clinical cancer research, uh, shown here in the translational uh, research retreat. Don't worry, there are not too many other people to thank. Um, and I'd also th like to thank our constituents, our patients, and their families. Um, on the right is Sister uh, Rose Egan, who is a, a, um, provides an endless stream of priest and rabbi jokes to me. Um, I enrolled her on a clinical trial testing a particularly novel a combination of chemotherapy and radioimmunotherapy for a very lethal form of lymphoma associated with an average survival of about two to three years. That was 12 years ago. Um, and she, she comes at each visit with, with a, a pile of jokes. Um, and pictured on the left are Emily Happy, an Einstein um, MD-PhD graduate, and her mother, Mary Jane Happy who was diagnosed with an early stage but aggressive form of triple negative breast cancer. Mary Jane also uh, volunteered to participate in a clinical trial. That was seven years ago. And she remains cancer free. Although the clinical trial that she uh, participated in did not turn out to be positive, she may have been cured by the weekly paclitaxel chemotherapy regimen that we established was highly effective in a prior trial. And she received this regimen as part of her routine clinical care. It isn't uncommon for physicians to, to say that they stand on the shoulders of giants. I just came back from a meeting where I heard a bunch of people say that when, when receiving accolades. Um, when, they do, when they do so, they usually men, mean their colleagues. But in cancer clinical research, the true giants are the patients. So finally, I'd like to thank my family who are here with us, um, in part to see me, in part because I know I'm taking them to Patricia's after this, <laughs> um, who, share my, who share my Bronx roots. Um, starting on your right is the newest member of, of my family, my son-in-law, Billy. He's a public school teacher in the Bronx, so the Bronx tale continues. To his right is my daughter, Alyssa, also a school teacher in the Bronx. Um, in the middle is my uh, daughter, Jennifer, here celebrating her recent graduation from New York Medical College with a master's degree in speech pathology. She tells me she's currently evaluating career opportunities in Montefiore. <laughs> so that could be a fourth person in the Bronx. And finally, to my, to my left is my wife, Lori. I had to travel all the way to South Yonkers to find her. <laughs> and um, she's, been with me, she's been with me ever since, usually waiting for me, um, and sometimes at my side. But finally, I would like to thank all of you for turning out for this event, for supporting the um, evolving partnership between Einstein and Montefiore. I think this is a critical time for these two great organizations for many reasons, uh, one of which is our search for a new cancer center director who will lead the cancer program for the next decade or longer. I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what may be possible in the future. 
And I hope that many of you here today uh, will continue to contribute to that. Thank you.